Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name's uh, Jeff Eggleston. I'm hosting, uh, sorry, not hosting, chairing the session, I should say. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I work for IBM. I'm in the systems hardware group. Um, today's session is an introduction to ZOS uh, container extensions and uh, Steve Warren based out in IBM Poughkeepsie is going to be taking us through. Um, the session is, is 1AT. That number is very important because we would like you to give feedback because feedback drives getting the likes of Steve and all the other presenters back for the next event and, and GSE really does thrive on the, um, on, on the feedback. Um, as far as questions are concerned, please, please ask questions um, throughout. Um, we would actually encourage questions. They'll come up in a chat box, and if Steve doesn't notice it, I will, and I'll make sure he does answer them as we go along. So I don't have anything further to say except, Steve, take it away. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's always a privilege of uh, talking with you and to interact with you. Uh, welcome, everyone, and good afternoon. And for those folks that are joining uh, in other remote places, good evening and good morning as well. Um, my name is Steve Warren. Let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I uh, am a uh, architect working in the IBM Garage for Systems, uh, it used to be known as the Worldwide Client Experience Center in Poughkeepsie, New York, back in the States. Um, and uh, I, but the vast majority of my career was spent in ZOS development, and so I have a have a strong development background in the in the ZOS space. Um, I, it's always a privilege working with the GSE, and I've had the privilege of being an on-site presenter for the last few years and uh, have a number of topics that were uh, that I'm, I'm speaking on, uh, including the very next session slot, which is a, a ZOS support for the IBM Z15. Uh, that will be co-presenting with Marna Wally, uh, and that's in the next session slot immediately following this, so I'd encourage you to, to take part in that. Um, so with that, I think we'll just get started here and uh, uh, we're going to be talking here about an exciting uh, new um, execution environment on ZOS that has gotten a lot of attention and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you will see that the possibilities with something called ZOS container extension. So let's kick it off and uh, please feel free to ask questions uh, throughout the presentation. And Jeff will will uh, uh, get my attention to to, to uh, uh, answer your questions. So today we're going to talk about an overview of what is container extensions. So we're going to first just dive into the real basics about what what it's all about and what does it enable you to do. We're then going to talk about how do I get started with ZCX and how do I manage and monitor ZCX. This is a high level presentation. So uh, there will be, there are other opportunities that uh, you can have sometimes to have a more in depth um, uh, discussion. Myself also, I also give a uh, no charge workshop that's sponsored by IBM Garage for Systems that can go in for your client, for, for you as a client, can give you a two day immersion into this topic. And you can contact me for more information if you're interested in that. All right, let's just talk about the context of ZCX. So for many years, we have had this set of applications and this set of middleware. We've had COBOL PL1 assembler applications uh, deployed into um, middleware uh, execution environments like Kix and IMS, DB2, MQ. We have batch workloads. This workload has been the bread and butter of ZOS for many years and continues to have a lot of uh, our, our mission critical business applications running inside of this space. And that's been around for a long, long time. Then a number of years ago, we introduced a concept. It's back actually been a, a, a quite a few years ago, more than 20 years ago, we've introduced uh, something called Unix System Services. It used to be called uh, OMVS or Open Edition or what, regardless, this really opened up the ZOS ecosystem 
to a whole new set of applications. I could have written an application that was Unix compliant on another platform and I could bring it over to ZOS and I could recompile that program and suddenly that program would run. And so now I could run a set of Unix applications directly on ZOS through the, through the uh, environment created by ZOS Unix or Unix system services. And typically those programs used to be written in C or C++. Uh, as a result of that environment being uh, made available, we were able to then support a major programming uh, language, Java and, and the and JVMs that, that could then service a whole new set of Java applications that were running on ZOS. We then could uh, leverage WebSphere and WebSphere uh, allowing us to have uh, interoperability with other platforms, being able to send HTTP requests and many other requests coming from outside of, of ZOS into, into ZOS. And of course, all of these things then facilitated things such as ZOSMF, being able to run analytics directly on Z with Spark and to be able to uh, have this new open mainframe foundation, Zoe, uh, to be able to access uh, ZOS applications uh, and to be able to do application development using uh, common CICD tooling, et cetera. So uh, the ecosystem looked like this until just last year when IBM introduced something called ZOS container extensions, which is really the next evolution in the, the kinds of applications that can run on ZOS. So now in addition to those legacy applications that, that uh, a lot of our bread and butter is uh, applications still run in, and as well as this Unix environment, we now have this environment called ZOS Container Extensions, which allows me to run Linux on Z binaries packaged as Docker containers directly onto ZOS. So this is really a revolutionary, a revolutionary uh, new set of applications that could run on ZOS. Now, there are particular use cases, and we're going to talk about when does it make sense to potentially run one of these Linux on Z binaries directly on ZOS. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to talk about how ZCX actually works to some degree, and we're going to hopefully give you a good general overview and understanding of the ZCX uh, ecosystem. So this is a new function that is available on ZOS 2.4. Uh, so if you're running on, on one of the older releases of, of uh, ZOS that is still supported, uh, you will need to upgrade to 2.4. It has not been rolled back to 2.3, for example. And again, this allows us to deploy Linux on Z software components as Docker containers on a ZOS system. The key operative, and the, I'm going to be stressing several times today, is that the, the sweet spot and the use case for ZCX application, the ZCX environment is when you have applications that are running currently on Linux, for example, that are in direct support of existing ZOS workloads. This is the sweet spot. So if I have an application that is interacting with a ZOS application off platform, for example, I can gain a lot of benefits and the benefits are, are listed in the next two bullets. I don't need to, to uh, separately provision a, Z, uh, a separate Linux server to deploy this application. Typically in the distributed world, when I write a new Linux application, I'm gonna deploy a new Linux server to run that application on. In this case, I can run it directly on top of ZOS. So this is cool. So when I run it directly on top of ZOS, what benefits do I gain besides not having to provision a Linux server? Well, I can maintain the operational control of that application because it's running on ZOS. So this is very important for, for example, for coordinated disaster recovery. If I have an application that's a hybrid application that has parts that are on Linux and I have parts that are on ZOS, when I have a disaster recovery situation, I need to coordinate with uh, a 
uh, with several organizations potentially, not just my ZOS guys, but with another SysProg and to figure out how we're going to coordinate the moving of this hybrid application to another site, for example. This is just a one simple example of the operational control. When the application runs on ZOS, I have full control over that application and I can, I can facilitate that disaster recovery. We'll talk more about, about the, the other uh, qualities of service benefits that I gain, gain with this, but just be aware that the quality of service that are on ZOS are now available to a Linux application, which is really bizarre that I can have uh, some of those things. And in, in the next slide or so, we'll, we'll cover some of that stuff. Now, from a hardware perspective, what do I need to be able to enable this? You said, Steve, I need to have ZOS 2.4. Uh, what do I need from a hardware perspective? So I need a Z14, uh, particularly GA2 or higher level of, of, a, of, of, of hardware. So I can run with a Z14 GA2. I can run with uh, a Z15, both T01 and T02 models. And I have to have this feature code, which is called uh, uh, Container Hosting Foundation. It's just usually re referenced by its number 0104. And this um, feature code applies to at the Keck level. So I buy the feature code for a particular CPC. And now uh, any LPAR that I, that I choose to enable ZOS and ZCX, I now have the capabilities of being able to run ZCX on that particular uh, CPC. Now, um, more recently, uh, ZCX has offered what's called the ZCX try, a try and buy capability that is gonna allow you to, to, to test it out for a short period of time without having to purchase the feature code. So if you are already on a Z14 uh, or Z15, and you want to try ZCX, you can without having to pay for 90 days. And so uh, there's a way through, through, through some settings that you can actually enable that particular try and buy functionality as well as applying a, a service to your system. Okay, so that is a quick overview of, of what ZCX is. Now let's, let's go and talk a little bit more about what the goals of ZCX are. So if you guys have been around uh, a lot of software development nowadays, they have these, the, this concept of, of course, design thinking. And in design thinking, they have something called a hill statement. And what that hill statement really describes is, this is what a particular piece of software's goals are. It tells you the who, the what, and the wow about a particular um, piece of software and the goals of uh, when we write that software. And whenever we have something that comes in new, we always compare it against this Hill statement to make sure that what we're doing is, is in line with that. And so this is really the goal of ZCX, a solution architect, which could, depending on the size of your shop, could be almost anyone, including ZOS system programmers or uh, 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 many other different kinds of individuals with different hats. But a solution architect can create a solution to be deployed on ZOS based on components available as Docker containers in a Linux on Z ecosystem, transparently exploiting ZOS qualities of service without requiring ZOS development skills. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but really the goal here is that again, we can deploy a solution on ZOS that leverages ZOS qualities of service, but yet this application is still a Linux-based application uh, that's packaged as a Docker container. Steve, and we don't- a question, I do, uh, sorry, I thought you'd finished, but we've got- Sure, to... go ahead, go ahead. Holland. Um, so so uh, when we say Linux, does it have to be a Linux on Z image or do Linux on x86 uh, images work as well? Good question. Okay, that's a really great question. Okay, great. So the idea is, is that uh, this, the binaries that are going to run inside of a ZCX need to be binaries that run on the Z architecture. So 
uh, you can take an x86 application and and recompile that application so that it could run on a Linux or depending on the application, you might not have to do compilations depending on what it is. But you need to have you need to make sure that that th those binaries will actually run on a Z architecture. So when I when I take an application, I'm going to have different um, uh, op codes and different uh, uh, actual machine code that actually is going to be running on Z. So of course it needs to run uh, be able to run on Z. But that being said, uh, we can take applications. We there are a set of tooling that Z ZCX provides and actually. Um, there's a there's a project out there called Ambitus, which provides a development image framework that you can actually take uh, packages that were written in uh, or that were originally designed to run on other platforms and then to refactor them to run on Z. And once you refactor them to run Z, they can run on Linux on a Linux on Z or on a Linux one box, and they can also run in a ZCX. So the the answer is. Uh, there, you have to do a little bit of finagling to get it to work on a Linux on Z. But once you have it in the Linux on Z eco ecosystem running there, you can now choose where you're going to deploy that. It could be Linux on Z or a Linux on one uh, box or in ZCX. Steve, thank you very much. Mark, I hope that answers your question. If you could acknowledge that it does in the chat box, that would be good. Okay, thank you, Mark. He says it makes perfect sense. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, so let's move on to uh, the, the next slide. So first of all, let's talk about Docker. For folks in the distributed world uh, and in the world of Linux, Docker is, uh, is a very commonplace thing. But in the world of ZOS and in Z, a lot of folks don't know about Docker. So let's just give a quick overview of what Docker is. Really, you can think of it as the open source standard for packaging software. Um, uh, in, in most of the world. So they use this symbol of this, this uh, whale with a bunch of, of containers. Those containers look like containers that are on a, some kind of a barge that is going between China and let's say the UK or from, you know, being transporting these shipping containers. And these shipping containers uh, what's what's unique about those shipping containers, while the contents inside them may be very different, there is a common interface on the outside. Where, for example, they all stack very neatly onto the vessel. They all can go onto uh, uh, eighteen wheelers, or as you guys say in the UK, lorries, or what. Uh, uh, the 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 interface on the outside is uh, has a very standardized inter interface, and. Uh, a Docker container, inside of the Docker container, you have everything you need to be able to run that application. It makes being able to run that application on different platforms, uh, on different uh, environments very easily. And so the idea of, of a Docker container is that I can add all the software inside of this container uh, to what I need to actually run the application that I'm trying to run. So if I need to have a uh, programming language in there, I can add that in there. If I need to have a certain execution environment or certain other libraries there, I, they're all included inside of the package so that when I install this package on any um, uh, platform that is capable of running that architecture, uh, I'm, I'm all set. So just think about the difference between that and the way we we develop software right now with like, for example, SMPE. So uh, uh, in, in that methodology, you have the idea of pre-install steps. You're gonna have actually installing the software with all its prereqs and co-recs. You're then gonna have sometimes post-install steps that need to take place. So the reason why Docker has a lot of uh, traction in the world is because a lot of that things that we just talked about, you don't need to do with Docker. It's all self-contained within this, this container. And so again, this is gonna re the, reduce the, the complexity of installation and configuration for the user because it's already packaged inside of Docker. So there are a number of packages that are available in many different locations, including uh, one that is, uh, for example, Docker Hub. And so Docker Hub 
uh, provides a set of packages that run on various different architectures, including the architecture of IBM Z. And sometimes those packages have the reference of S390X. And S390X is the architecture uh, distinction on the on Docker Hub. And so if you want to search for packages that currently run on Linux on, on Linux on Z, on a Linux One Box, or in a ZCX, you can search for S390X. Sometimes it also has, has the des designation of IBM Z on that particular platform. But there's many places where you can get Docker packages that are available. So right out of the box, when uh, ZCX comes at, came out, there are a whole set of packages that we can get from places like Docker Hub that will, uh, from day one, run on in this environment. So again, we gain a large number of packages right out of the box. So this is just an open uh, source packaging standard. All right, so now we're going to actually talk a little bit about what actually makes up a ZCX. So uh, look at this uh, title of this slide. It sort of summarizes a lot about ZCX. It is a turnkey virtual Docker server software appliance. So what does that mean? It means that IBM has taken a, a set of software and prepackaged it together. So you don't have to procure your own uh, Linux image or kernel. You don't have to procure a Docker uh, engine or an SSH daemon, daemon or other pieces of software and make sure that everything interacts and works together. Instead, IBM has packaged all of those things and has delivered it as a turnkey appliance. So by doing so, it eliminates a lot of complexity. It also is maintained by IBM. So IBM, when there are new levels of these things, you don't actually have to go out and get the latest levels. It will automatically, uh, through IBM, they will provide service for that. Now, here's the great thing about this though. Some people say, uh-oh, they've modified the kernel and they've modified the Docker engine. That, that's not a good sign. That's gonna mean instant obsolescence because uh, you know, they're going to make changes to the to Linux kernel and IBM has their own version of it. And no, let me just start right there. IBM uses the an exact Linux kernel and exact Linux and Docker engine that is actually out there in the field. So there is no manipulation of the kernel or, or Docker engine or some of these other things so that it's for that you can stay current with, with uh, the most recent levels of code, but they will provide that maintenance and that, that maintenance can be installed in a very simple, simplistic way. Uh, and we'll, 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 talk, we'll touch on that just a little bit in just a few moments. Steve, we've got another question from Alan Playford, um, uh, which goes as follows. So is a Docker container package like a comprehensive Tarball Plus? <laughs> um, I wouldn't expect but, anything less from Alan, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, I mean, a, a, tar, a tarball. I mean, I'm I'm not an expert in 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 uh, in in some of in the, some of these packaging um, terminologies, but I, the way I, I I understand the difference is is that I have a whole bunch of prerequisites software. That I am that is necessary to run the application that I want to run. So let's say I want to run an application. It requires about five other packages of software, and it also requires, um, uh, you know, maybe even a programming language and you know several other runtimes. Those all things are going to be packaged together in one little piece right here, such that when I actually deploy that application, it's ready to run immediately. I don't have to do anything. I just say, I'm going to say Docker run. And if that package is already out there, it's actually going to pull the package down, install that image on there and actually launch a, a Docker container to actually, to, to actually run that. So uh, a Docker image is made up of all the pieces of software that you need to, to, to actually uh, run a particular application. And then when I actually am running that image live, it becomes a container. And so I think, I think that is, I hope that that explains a little bit more about what a, what a, what a Docker 
um, container package is like it's so the actual thing that you create is an image and then when you're it's actually running it becomes a, a container so that's another distinction between image and container steve a good question by alan and a good answer from you and alan's acknowledged that you've answered it so thank you very very much okay sure great wonderful keep the questions coming that's great Okay, so we talked about the fact that uh, that IBM is maintaining this appliance uh, and that there's nothing that you have to do to actually configure that appliance. Okay, now to actually provision this appliance, so I'm going to have to create one or more of these ZCX appliances to run on my ZOS and this appliance is actually executes in an address space. So this appliance is just another ZOS address space that contains this ZCX uh, code, which is gonna allow you to deploy Linux uh, uh, containers within it. So how do we actually uh, provision this? Well, we use uh, the ZOSMF workflow technology to actually provision one of these ZCX servers. So ZOSMF, uh, of course, has been around for many years and workflows is really nothing more than a guided step-by-step -step process uh, for you to be able to uh, perform a, a task. And in this case, the step-by-step -step process is going to prompt you for user input fields of when you're creating this appliance. And then in the background, it's going to actually submit jobs, scripts, uh, and do whatever is necessary to, to fully build this um, uh, ZCX server address space on your behalf. Okay, so again, it's going to provide uh, this address space has standard Docker interfaces. And so you're going to be able to, through the Docker command line interface, through an SSH client that could be running on your on your work on your workstation, for example, you can do an, an SSH um, uh, communication in, to this Docker environment, and then you can issue standard Docker commands like you would in any environment that has a Docker environment. So this is, this is really cool. And at the same time, we're gonna be leveraging ZOS technology under the covers. So we're going to uh, be being able to leverage some of the capabilities of TCP IP and to be able to communicate very rapidly between uh, uh, my, my ZCX container that's running, uh, a container that's running in ZCX and a ZOS address space. Now, some folks immediately say, this is a little scary. I'm running Linux applications uh, side by side with my ZOS applications. Uh, it's in an address space. Do they have access to common storage? Can they, are there these proprietary interfaces? I'm, I'm a little worried about this. The answer is to those, you don't need to worry. The interface is the, the Linux container doesn't necessarily need to be coded specifically for ZCX. In other words, it's going to be inter interacting with uh, Docker in the same way you would interact with Docker on any other platform. So what this means is that my Linux application to communicate with ZOS doesn't have access to, com to common storage. Instead, it's going to be using um, the TCP IP uh, flows to go back and forth. That being said, those TCP IP flows are going to be highly optimized using uh, same host technology that we'll talk about in just a few moments. Um, so uh, again, there are, there are some benefits there. Um, another thing that we should talk about also is that, again, there's no ZOS skills that are required to develop and deploy these Docker containers. So the, with, with this Docker CLI, I'm just going to issue Docker commands. I don't need to, to, to really be aware as a Docker admin that I'm running on ZOS. So it, you're just gonna be using that standard interface. Now, we do have some restrictions because this is a turnkey appliance, we don't want you necessarily mucking around with the appliance. So you're not gonna have direct access to the underlying Linux kernel, which means you can't get necessarily root access to be able to modify whatever you, whatever you want, okay? Now, uh, again, this is managed as a ZOS process. It's an address space. So I can have multiple instances of these 
and uh, I'm going to be using standard ZOS operational procedures to maintain the address space. So I can start and stop the address space, and I can do uh, many other address space like things. A, a lot of the uh, recording and information that an address space would have, I'm going to have, we're going to talk about from a WM perspective. Again, uh, uh, that you're going to be able to manage this address space using the workload manager. And what's cool, uh, the, the last thing I'll talk about on this slide is that this particular address space uh, is zip eligible. And which means that th for uh, in some measurements now that they, they have like over 98% of the ZCX CPU consumption was measured to be zip eligible. So which means that applications running in this particular space are not gonna be affecting your four hour rolling average. Okay, so this is an important consideration also when you're considering to use ZCX. Okay, so again, it's sort of like the, the link that connects Linux software with ZOS software and they're co-located and there's a lot of benefits with that co-location. So let's talk about the qualities of service that your Linux application suddenly gets because it's now running on ZOS. Well, we haven't talked about it yet about what the underlying storage mechanism is of where the Linux disks are. So when you're talking about a Linux application, there are disks that it needs to be able to read and write from. And those Linux disks, disks are actually uh, mapped as vSAM linear data sets. And because they are vSAM linear data sets, I get all of the ZOS qualities of service associated with vSAM. What does that mean? It means I have access to uh, um, automatic uh, pervasive encryption that if I want to, of hyperswap technology, Z hyperlink, and all the other technologies associated with vSAM are at your disposal. Let's go over to the left and look at disaster recovery. I mentioned this before that now GDPS can coordinate my disaster recovery, including my Linux application, because it resides on ZOS in the ZOS address space. So I don't need to coordinate with non-ZOS admins when I'm, when, I, when I'm moving workloads or having a disaster recovery action or whatever else. Let's move to the networking side. ZCX supports dynamic virtual IP addresses or sometimes just referred to as DVIPAS. This technology will allow you to move your ZCX server from one particular member of your Sysplex to another member of the Sysplex yet keeping the same IP address. This is important for availability when I'm trying to target a particular IP address that is uh, backed by a ZCX application, I need to make sure that if I move that server to another uh, location, another LPAR in my, in my um, Sysplex, that it, in fact, that IP address is still gonna be the same from the end user's point of view. I also am leveraging same host technology. This is allowing a very fast uh, interaction between my, my Linux on Z application running in ZCX and my native ZOS application. So I'm going to be able to really leverage the, those capabilities as well and having these memory moves for, for uh, a network flow instead of having to go over through a networking card or to go through a very low levels of the IP stack. And lastly, for, uh, we're gaining workload management uh, benefits. We'll have a slide that talks a little bit more about this, but now I have the ability to assign service goals and business importance levels to, and the, also the ability to cap resource consumption, all using the capabilities and powers of WLM. And we even have capacity provisioning manager support. You have SMF support for account chargeback, et cetera all just because we're running on ZOS and this is just another ZOS address space. Okay, let's talk about some quick use, use cases before we dive down into a little more details about what ZCX has. So first of all, what, what types of applications would we want to maybe leverage in ZCX? Well, there's a whole set of applications that now can greatly expand this ZOS software ecosystem. So whether it's running the latest microservices that maybe already interact with ZOS applications and now I can co-locate them for uh, you know, better qualities of service and operational control, whether it's non-SQL databases like MongoDB, 
ZOS over the over the last many years has tried to establish a uh, a strong analytics framework in which I, data gravity comes into into play, where I I, I want to be able to be able to perform analytics as close to the data as possible. I don't want to pay for ETL offloads. I don't want to have to worry about multiple copies of the data or or copies of the data that are old, um, transactional uh, analytics. And, it, and a number of frameworks have been provided in the ZOS space to be able to start to perform analytics on the data directly on ZOS without having to move it off. But man, many of those analytics frameworks are still currently not on ZOS. What if there, the analytics plat framework is available uh, in a Linux on Z binary? That I could then package as a Docker container and run in ZCX. I now have a whole more, uh, a much larger set of frameworks now at my disposal to be able to perform that on ZOS analytics. Steve, Messaging framework. Question. Sorry to yeah, sure. Um, it's um, from Sean. He says, uh, "Can you have um, a Z container address spaces?" On a different LPAS in a Sysplex using the same DV IPA for high availability. Okay, so the question, if I understand it right, is that can I have two different LPAR, two, let me make sure, two different ZCX on, on multiple systems in my Sysplex that have the same DVIPA address for high availability? So we'll talk more about clustering and orchestration. Um, so you can accomplish clustering and orchestration and have high availability with ZCX, but the way to accomplish that is not through having uh, multiple uh, systems that have the same DVIPA. In my, in my understanding of DVIPA, and I'm not, I'm not uh, Working in Raleigh, where the where the comm server uh, experts are, but my understanding is that you can only have one active DVIPA in a Sysplex. But that being said, if you have your clustering orchestration framework set up, you can have a control node and worker nodes that actually will accomplish what you're trying to do by being able to uh, have a worker node, one or more worker node, I mean one or more control nodes, be able to process incoming work and then distribute that work over to worker nodes that could reside on many different ZCX boxes. So while uh, you can't have a multiple active, uh, multiple uh, uh, locations that have the same DVIPA address as far as, as, far as, as my knowledge goes, uh, you can accomplish what you're trying to do for high availability by using clustering and orchestration technology. I hope that answered your question. I hope I, I got the gist of what that what that question was. Sean, if you could just acknowledge, yes, he, he's acknowledged. Uh, great okay. question and a great answer, Steve. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, just moving along here, some other messaging frameworks. Kafka is a huge messaging framework uh, that is that a lot of folks are using with producing and be able to consume messages. Uh, App Connect Enterprise is another big application that allows you to, to join maybe uh, applications that are have different messaging formats and different protocols and to be able to link the, those applications together. You have web server proxies and emerging programming uh, languages. All of these things can run in ZCX to provide your uh, great expansion of this kinds of software that can run on ZOS and that can interact with your legacy or uh, ZOS Unix applications that are already there. We also have system management components uh, that, that support ZOS that today were not available on ZOS themselves. And I'm thinking of, uh, for example, IBM Service Manager Unite, kind of like a dashboard that takes like IBM system automation, NetView, Omegamon, and really gives you like a consolidated view and control of your ZOS systems. This can now be located directly on ZOS if you choose to do so. And then finally, uh, another set of applications are open source application development utilities to be able to host your own GitLab or GitHub server directly on ZOS, to be able to have a lot of Linux-based development tools 
uh, Ant and Maven and other, other tooling and technology that allows you to, to create a, an effective CIC, excuse me, CICD pipeline. This all can be now hosted and, and execute directly on ZOS. And there are some uh, good reasons why you may wanna do that. So this is just a, a small sampling of some of the things, applications that you can now run directly on ZOS. All right, let's dig a little bit more into the storage integration. So Steve, you said that <clears throat> you, we did not, you did not modify the Linux kernel, you didn't modify Docker, and yet you're talking to vSAM. I heard you say vSAM is the back of the backing of the Linux disks. How can you possibly do that? Well, the answer is something called vert.io devices. And vert.io is not unique to ZCX. This is a concept that was introduced by uh, Linux uh, 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 many, many years ago that allows us to have a gateway to be able to be able to interact with different storage subsystems and many other ways that we're going to be doing IO. So we're going to talk about networking in just a few moments as well. So using vert IO devices, we're able to basically intercept um, calls that are going out to Linux disk and to be able to convert that into a vSAM call and write to these vSAM linear data sets. So again, allows us to have this, un, uh, this, this uh, unmodified open source Linux for Z by using these vert.io devices. And so again, like we said before, now you're talking to, to, to vSAM data sets and you have all the capabilities of vSAM, including host encryption, replication, hyperswap, uh, hyperlink, et cetera. Okay. Let's talk now about uh, the networking side. Now there's a vert IO for networking uh, device, which is gonna interact with ZOS TCP IP. Each ZCX appliance has its own dynamic virtual IP address. And so with these dynamic virtual IP addresses, I have one dynamic virtual IP address for server number one, I'm going to have another one for server number two. And again, this is going to allow for us to restart the ZCX on another system in the Sysplex and yet maintain that same IP address. So even though the dynamic virtual IP address, uh, even though the, 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 the static IP address is going to be the, a different for each one of these potential LPARs, the DVIPA is going to be the same. Okay, so again, this is for high availability. We also uh, am using this, this same host technology, which allows us to really, like I said, short circuit a lot of the lower levels of the, pro of the TCP IP protocols, uh, and as well as uh, be able to not have to uh, touch the, the, the actual communications card uh, out, out there. Uh, and so uh, the OS Express card, for example, is not going to be coming into play talking between uh, uh, a ZCX application and a ZOS application. Instead, it's going to be using these memory moves uh, to, to transfer that data and the TCP IP is satisfied with, with, uh, with that technology. Same host has been around for a while and ZCX is just leveraging it. Another cool thing that ZCX is leveraging is when work is coming inbound from outside of ZOS through your OSA Express card is that ZCX now can leverage something called inbound work queues. So there already are inbound work queues available uh, for many other applications and ZCX is just another ancillary uh, queue. And so with this, I can segregate my ZCX traffic from my regular native ZOS traffic. And this is gonna provide several benefits. First of all, I'm gonna have shorter queue lengths for my ZCX incoming traffic. I can do parallel processing in, in uh, ZOS TCP IP. And lastly, I'm able to uh, have even TCP IP, the part that deals with the ZCX workload, even that can be offloaded to zip. So some really good benefits of running with IWQ support which is available uh, via uh, some APARs. And then finally, we can do uh, also uh, IP filters to restrict external access. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the, uh, 
about the address space and CPU memory and workload management. So in terms of memory, for each ZCX server, I am going to designate the amount of memory that I want this particular ZOS address space to consume. This area is private ab above the two gigabyte bar, but it is fixed memory today. So what that means is that whatever memory you assign to this ZCX server, you are going to basically uh, make that memory only available to this address space and none other. So you need to be aware when you're planning for that, that you pick a reasonable amount of memory. And but because uh, just the, the definition of fixed memory is that that memory is really off the off the table for any other address space to use. Uh, and so uh, this is how it, it's being used. Again, managed by the VSM and RSM. So let's talk about the engines that are gonna be used to run uh, your ZCX workloads. So uh, we have the ideas of what we refer to as virtual CPUs that are provisioned to each ZCX uh, address space. These virtual CPUs are, are basically nothing more than MVS TCBs or tasks. So there's gonna be a task for every virtual CPU that you have. Now, if I wanna run things in parallel today, I'm going to be needing to have multiple tasks and I need to have actual physical hardware behind it that is actually gonna be able to fulfill the fact that I have three tasks in an address space. If I have three tasks in address space and I only have one processor that's gonna be servicing those, I'm not really running multitasking. I'm not really running parallel processing. Instead, I'm gonna be relying on the system to give task one control, then task two, then task three. So if I have two virtual CPs, I'm gonna to wanna to have enough engines so that I can literally run multiple things in parallel. So I wanna have some zips that are gonna be backing those, those uh, virtual CPs, okay? I'm also going to have normal workload manager controls for this particular address space. So I can have a service class that specifies a velocity goal uh, that is going to be sufficient to be able to, to handle the amount of work and the priorities that I have in the ZCX address space. I can have more than one ZCX address space and I may choose to give different priorities depending on, I might have mission critical work in one ZCX address space and I might have less critical work in another one. And so I can appropriately give workload manager that those goals. Uh, and again, I can cap my resources as well using resource groups or tenant resource groups. I'm able to um, specify a cap of, of one or more of these ZCX appliances so that I don't overwhelm the system uh, with just ZCX activity, for example. And of course, because this is a regular address space, I have normal SMF records associated with an address space. So your type 30s and 72s. Uh, and then you, you have, you're able to gain some insights through things like RMF to be able to, to uh, measure what's going on for the, on the, at the address space level. Okay, so there may be a cases you, where, you, where you only need to have a single ZCX server running on your system. There may be cases where you might want to have multiple. And why would I choose to have one or having multiple? Well, I just mentioned one of them. I have different priorities. So I want to give one set of workload, a higher workload manager execution velocity goal, for example, compared to another. I also might want to cap resources for one set of applications. And so I want to do it uh, just at, at the ZCX server level rather than using resource groups. I could do that. I also may want to isolate applications. So I may have an application that uh, uh, I don't want to adversely affect another set of applications, or I have different business units that that really those applications don't belong together. And I don't want the Docker admin to be able to have access to, uh, to, an, to one set of applications. I only want the Docker admin to have it uh, to set A instead of set B. So there's many ways why you can segregate the applications. But again, you can have more than one server on a ZCX. Each one of these servers is going to have its own storage, uh, network, and memory resources. So each one's going to have their own DVIPA. Each one is going to have 
their own memory allocation. Remember, it's fixed uh, memory above the bar. So just be aware of that. And I also am going to have, um, they're each going to have their own Linux set, set of Linux disks. Okay, so each one is going gonna, is gonna to take up a, a space for Linux disks, space for memory, and they're going to also be able to have their own networking resources. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on to the next slide here because we're, I realize we have about 10 minutes left. So let's talk a little bit about operations and disaster recovery integration. So again, because it's a normal address space, I have the same capabilities like of issuing start and stop and modify commands uh, from the console to be able to affect uh, this particular address space. I can do automated operations. So I can use IBM system automation. I can use ARM. I can use another ZOS automation framework to help control the uh, life cycle of a, a ZCX appliance. Uh, again, I can have planned and unplanned outage and disaster recovery coordination. And uh, I, I can do a couple of different things here. So a Docker server failure, I can restart it in place. So using these technologies that, that I just mentioned before, I can simply refire it up. If, that, if, that, if I want to bring that down, I can restart it and I can have one of those automation products or ARM actually uh, assist in restarting uh, a, a particular ZCX in place. I can also move it to a different location. So this is where the DVIPA comes into place, right? So I have a, a different physical I, uh, static IP address uh, of between my two ZOS systems, but I, it's very easy if I bring down one system for either planned or unplanned outages, I can then just restart that server on another, on another uh, system in the Sysplex, the DVIPA moves over to that particular system. And now I have that the, um, the same IP address uh, for that guy. I can also even do it from remote sites. Oh, let me just go back to this previous slide here. So on this previous slide, uh, this of course assumes that I have shared DASD between the two systems in my ZOS uh, Sysplex here so that I can have access to the vSAM data sets that are associated with my appliance, right? In the case of a site to site move, again, uh, I can easily move uh, if my entire site goes down with ZCX, as long as I have vSAM data replication so that I have a, a copy of my vSAM data sets associated with my ZCX on the other site, I can effectively move that DVIPA will move directly over there and my, my server can restart even on a remote site, thanks to the underlying ZOS technology that ZCX exploits. All right, just quickly some personas in the last uh, eight or 10 minutes of our talk here today. We have a number of folks that would be involved in the ZCX story here and we'll just talk briefly about uh, some who, who is going to be responsible for what aspects of ZCX. So when we're talking about provisioning a ZCX, this is talking about allocating the ZOS resources for that. The number of virtual CPs we want, the memory, the network connectivity and storage. These may be one person in your shop. They may be four different people in your shop, depending on the size of, of, of your company. Um, now, in terms of the Docker configuration settings, you may consult with your Docker admin to say, okay, what kind of registry would you like? Because I have to, when I'm provisioning it, I have to choose what kind of registry I want. Uh, and also what other logging options do you want? And maybe a few other things. Do you need a Docker registry? Um, and where is that located? And does it need to be secure? There are a few things where you might interact with your Docker admin to give you some piece of information when you're actually provisioning. And remember, the provisioning is done using ZOSMF workflows. So I can provision by following the steps. I can provision an instance in a few minutes once I know all the values that I need to enter in. If I need to reprovision that the second time, those values are saved and maintained. And so the next time you do it, it's literally a few clicks and you can reprovision it, right? Uh, again, you're going to need some. You're going to need to have some guidance for out of band, uh, out of band steps. For example, uh, the the IP configuration, the workload manager considerations, any RACF or SAF resources that I need to use, uh, and DFSMS setup. So, but this is generally speaking how 
you're going to provision, you could, the, the ZOS system programmer is going to be heavily involved, but consulting with a lot of those other admins as well as the Docker admin. And again, uh, it's not just about provisioning, you can also reconfigure in place a ZCX uh, instance. So if I need to increase the resources of it, if I need to add additional disks, I can do so using other ZOSMF workflows that are provided by IBM. From a Docker uh, administrator perspective, once, they, once uh, this uh, appliance has been provisioned, I now can tell the Docker admin, okay, here's some log on credentials for you to log on. They can um, actually go into SSH and they can uh, go ahead and issue Docker commands. And all the Docker commands that you see when you issue Docker help, they're all available in this environment. So I can actually deploy my, my Linux applications and depending on um, of how much uh, uh, visibility I choose to make my Docker ZCX server instance, I can actually just download directly from Docker Hub or I can download from my corporate registry Docker registry to be able to uh, get an image on that system and to be able to deploy and execute, a, a, have a running container running in my ZCX server. Let's talk just briefly about security. From a security perspective, there are three options for managing user security and, and, and requests coming into the system. The first is what we refer to as a local appliance registry. We recommend this as your first way of, of getting your feet wet with, with ZCX. Uh, using this technology, uh, basically it's, uh, I have a local appliance registry of security of valid user IDs. So I can issue pseudo commands, for example, in Linux to create, at, to add users to the system and to be, allow them to be able to access um, uh, to be able to log on as a Docker uh, admin and or for authentication purposes when, our, when an inbound request to an application is coming in, I can have the credentials defined locally. While this is a very uh, easy way of, of initially setting things up, uh, probably later on you may consider to, to use uh, ZOS LDAP server with RACF integration. This is going to allow you to maybe that then uh, to have folks log in with RACF credentials. So you can actually authenticate that, that um, using uh, a RACF credential. And if you want to up the ante a little more, you can use remote LDAP. And using that technology, you can have for your whole enterprise a same logon regardless of platform. Uh, we're not going to talk much about this right now due to uh, time restraints right now, but uh, there are lots of security options that are available for you here. You can also have a graphical user interface. Some folks just do not like the command line interface or they're not familiar with the command line interface. And so there's a Docker package you can install called Portainer, which allows you to have a graphical view of what containers and what images I have installed on, on a particular ZCX server that's readily available. I can also, for performance monitoring, let's just talk for uh, uh, 30 seconds about that. We said that Workload Manager has an overall view of the address space and can look at from an overall address space, it knows how much IO, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, certain tasks were dispatched to run on a zip engine, da, 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 da. It knows from a, a overall uh, address space perspective, but it doesn't have insight into the particular containers that are consuming those IO resources, networking resources, memory resources, et cetera. So there, are, there is a set of tooling available out that can be downloaded from uh, Docker Hub uh, that will allow you to gain insights into what is being used, both from a Linux appliance perspective and from individual containers perspective. And so you have these tools called Node Exporter, C Advisor, Grafana, and Prometheus that will together perform a consolidated dashboard view of exactly what resources are being consumed by which container. We, we I talked briefly about clustering and orchestration. So out of the box, uh, ZOS supports something called Docker Swarm. Docker Swarm allows you to be able to have orchestrate a number of uh, applications for high availability, I can have the concept of having a, a set of 
manager nodes and a set of worker nodes. And so these manager and worker nodes work together to actually, to actually create a high availability application. That being said, the future direction, which was made in uh, a, a, um, a statement of direction uh, back over a year ago was that ZCX is gonna be focusing on uh, Kubernetes in the future. And so Kubernetes will be another way that you will be able to orchestrate your workloads. And so this is a uh, cool technology. Stay tuned for more in this space. It's really exciting. Some of the things that are gonna be coming out soon for ZCX in relation to being able to support clustering using standardized, the industry standard clustering technology, Kubernetes. Steve, um, Morton's asked, and where does OpenShift come into play? So, Good okay. So that is a great question. So as you know that uh, IBM uh, had uh, acquired Red Hat and OpenShift is a very uh, strategic uh, technology that IBM is, is uh, leveraging all around the company. And so with that, I would say stay tuned for that. Kubernetes and OpenShift are, are, are working hand in hand. And so uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised by or, or pleasantly delighted by the offering that, that, will be a, that will be announced very soon by IBM in relation to uh, the, the OpenShift, uh, OpenShift and, and ZCX. That's all I can say about that at the time. I hope that answers the question, Morton. If you can just acknowledge it, that'd be very helpful. Yep, he's given a smiley face. So thank you, Stephen. Uh, so how do I get started today? Uh, we're, we're one minute over and this is really the last slide. So we're pretty much on time. Uh, so if I want to start playing with ZCX today, what do I need to do? Well, first of all, you have to make sure you're on ZOS 2.4. It will not run on 2.3 and it will not be rolled back to 2.3. So you need to be on 2.4. You need to have ZOSMF installed and running because ZOSMF is the, is the mechanism of which you are going to provision the ZCX workflows and perform uh, uh, the, the ZCX uh, life cycles. So uh, in, in order to provision, deprovision, to uh, change the configuration, to apply maintenance, et cetera, you are all gonna need, you're gonna need to be using uh, ZOSMF. The next thing you knew is you, you, you're gonna need is to make sure you have the rights to use ZCX on the particular uh, Keck of which the LPAR that you wish to run ZCX is on. So the way to do that is you can either purchase the feature code or you can do use the ZCX trial. And so uh, I would encourage you to uh, consider uh, you know, using the trial if you don't have it there uh, and to just see if, if, if that would meet your needs. Again, you have to plan your resources, your memory, your storage, your zips, your DVIPAs, et cetera, uh, to, to know how much resource you wanna uh, allocate to a particular ZCX appliance. You're then going to start, you're going to provision the ZCX server and then start it and then install your Docker applications and then you're ready to go. And your applications now can, your, your um, Docker applications running in ZCX can then interact with your ZOS applications and uh, uh, really some exciting things here. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that is uh, available in terms of online. There's a couple great red books that are out there, including one that just came out a little while ago, which is the ZOS container use cases one, the fourth one down this list. And like I mentioned before, uh, I offer a workshop uh, as part of the uh, IBM Garage for Systems and it's no charge. Just contact me. My, my contact information is on here if you're interested in knowing more about ZCX. Uh, and how, what it can do for your company. And with that, I think I am pretty much done. There's some, some more YouTube videos that are available out there um, that you're welcome to watch that will show you, walk you through a little bit of some of the actions you need to do to get ready to use ZCX. Please take a moment and fill out your session evaluation. It gives us an opportunity to know what we're doing right, what we could do better, and even things uh, you know, that maybe you would like to see in the future. So just take a moment and please uh, just, just uh, uh, fill out uh, some session feedback for us. Steve, thank you very much. Um, just out of interest, you, you peaked 38. And as we stand, we have 37 people still on. So one person has dropped off. I think that's fantastic. I think you've done a fantastic job. Uh, fantastic questions, fantastic answers all around. A, a really good show. And thank you very much. 
Um, one thing I would like to point out that this show was, uh, well, sorry, show session, feels like a show, Steve, it was very uh, good. Um, <laughs> was, um, sponsored by Red Hat. Um, and again, um, it's, it's, you know, our vendors that actually sponsor us that also help us uh, run these sessions. Um, the, the last point I would like to make is, Steve, have you, oh yes, uh, in the corner, he's, he's actually mentioned, and there's a logo there, NH Charities Together. Again, if you felt this is good, a, a small charity donation to our charity would be very, very good. And if you're feeling that you can afford over a hundred pounds, Mark Wilson has committed um, to actually mention you in name. That was what Mark said last night on his, uh, key oh, well, not last night, it was yesterday after, I think it was yesterday afternoon on his keynote speech. So I'm just gonna leave it a few minutes if there's any more questions before I close it. I'll give it a minute or two. Um, no, I, I'm gonna call it one, two, three. I'm gonna call it, I feel like an auctioneer here. Um, <laughs> so, so Steve, once again, thank you very much. And dare I say, thank you to our audience uh, as we live in interesting times running these sessions. Thank you all for your support. I'm gonna bring this to an end and thank you very much. Yep. Thanks, guys.